Hi, this week I'm in Saudi Arabia hiding from the coronavirus. Or rather, I'm terrorizing all my friends by telling them that I have the coronavirus. Anyways, my time here is almost done, which means that I should probably get out of this country, which also means that I need to take an airplane somewhere. And from the title of this video, you can probably guess that that airplane would be um, an airplane that is... I didn't really think this through before I started talking, so let's do this again. Today we're going to be talking about Pegasus, which is a Turkish holiday airline, just a euphemism for a budget airline. I'm going to be flying them from here in Riyadh over to Istanbul in what they call business economy, whatever that is. Uh, let's check it out. This morning's flight departs from the Saudi capital in the wee hours. With no in-flight map nor the ability to see discernible landmarks outside, I had no idea what route we took. So the route you're seeing on screen is just a manifestation of my imagination. And before you smart asses go on a crusade in the comments, Flight Radar didn't know which route we took either. Um. Yeah, I'm pretty lost. Uh, I'm not sure where I am, but that door is very pretty. Oh, I actually saw so all of these doors. I hear screaming, that should be correct. So, you might be wondering what I'm doing here in Saudi. Well, given that this is where my parents live, and also where I did the majority of my growing up, I think it's safe to say that I'm visiting home. My family moved to the Riyadh in the year 2000, and since then I've seen it go from a quiet little town with one mall and one skyscraper to the metropolis that it is today. Since I moved away some 7 years ago, a lot has changed, and a lot is changing still. When I go back, I'll make a proper film about this beautiful country, set in the most inhospitable of climates, but home to the most hospitable of people. The Riyadh gets its name from the Arabic word meaning garden or meadows, but really, the city is just an airbase with 7.5 million people living around it. For an aviation enthusiast, it's heaven as you'll often get to see F-15s, typhoons, rafales, and other military jets and helicopters flying around during the day. The urban area is built like a US population center, with massive highways and roads catering to a very heavy dependence on cars. But things are changing, namely the six lines of the brand new metro system, which will start operations later this year, inshallah, connecting the city to the airport. King Khaled International doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. It seems as if every time they decided to do something with the complex, they just deemed it a giant mishwar and left it to the next group of people. Out of the four original terminals, one was never opened and another has been closed undergoing renovations since 2016. Terminal 5 is the newest addition and now handles domestic flights which were previously based in T3. There is a separate royal terminal, which is reserved for the kingdom's sovereign, his kin, dignitaries, and other people much more important than us lowly plebs, but I'll be departing out of Terminal 1, so let's pick up the action there. These original terminals are actually quite cozy, with each hosting only about a dozen gates. Built in 1984, the architecture is a pretty remarkable execution of blending tradition with modernity. The design is supposed to emulate a traditional Bedouin tent, and it does so with tasteful forethought into using the abundant desert sunlight during the day and subdued lighting at night. For a couple of years, this terminal building was somewhat neglected and became quite run down, and yes, that is me in the photo. But more recently, it's been shown a little bit more love and happily has had the life brought back into it. Check-in for my flight began two and a half hours before we were due to depart. There were no priority lines other than for families with small children and people with disabilities who were waved to the front. Since I had quite a lot of luggage with me, I booked myself onto their business flex fare, which everyone at the airline kept referring to as business, but it really wasn't. This fare did grant me quite a lot of extra baggage allowance though, which I took advantage of in its entirety, a savings of about 120 US dollars had I paid for just extra luggage. With that out of the way, it was time to head through border control. The airport authority here recently rolled out these automated systems, which are suspiciously similar to the ones used in the states and Canada. But unlike the ones in the states and Canada, which usually work with a Canadian passport, uh, this one didn't. It told me to go see a human. Having then seen a human, I was processed through security and found myself deposited in the duty-free area. 
Now, you might find it counterintuitive that this terminal doesn't have any high-end shopping outlets given the immense oil wealth of this country. The truth is, the rich people here are so rich they almost always travel by charter or private jet, not wanting to commingle with the common folk, at least they catch a disease or something. But I'm gonna shut up now since I'm here to sit in an airplane and not incite a class war. Also, private aviation is relatively inexpensive in the Gulf for a myriad reasons, one of which is the stable low cost of fuel. Oh, so it's one o'clock in the morning right now. My flight boards in exactly one hour. Yes, they make it very simple here. Um, there are two lounges here in this terminal that you can get into with priority pass. One of which is the Welcome Lounge, which is absolute garbage. And the other one is a Plaza Premium Lounge, which I visited in a previous Lothansa Premium Economy video. So if you're interested to see what that one is like, go ahead and watch that video. Otherwise, I'm not gonna go into a lounge today as I have a limited number of visits per year with my priority pass. And it's not really worth the 45 minutes that I'm gonna spend in there anyways. So I'm just gonna chill here. This terminal was refurbished a couple years ago. It's very clean, it's nice, it's well lit. Uh, really all you can ask for. It's really small as well. There's only a few gates in it, so it feels really cozy. You've always got empty waiting areas that you can hang out in. And there's also Huawei charging stations. There's also a Burger King behind me, which is a rare find in an airport. And uh, otherwise, otherwise it's pretty eventless. I'm gonna put this gigantic tripod away and um, go grab a coffee and get some work done, I guess. I don't mean to boast or anything, but even though I haven't lived in an Arabic-speaking country for years, I still had no trouble understanding the announcements. Please do not leave your baggage. Uh, mostly because they also came in English. A little bit later, our plane arrived, a 737-800. Pegasus flies exclusively narrow bodies, and only the 737 and A320 families of aircraft. They do, however, have plans to transition to an Airbus-only fleet in the future, getting rid of these older Boeing workhorses. I would like to mention that Turkish also flies this route from Riyadh to Istanbul, albeit to a different airport. I didn't take that flight partly because I've been flying too much Turkish lately, but mostly because that flight was three times the price of this one. When it was time to board, it was not done so by zone. Instead, passengers were asked to form a line around the waiting area. I wasn't familiar with the strategy and consequently ended up at the back of the line. This flight was fully booked, so it did take me quite a while to get on the jet bridge. Now, I am all in favor of idiot proofing, but this sign might have been a little overkill. Upon boarding, I immediately found my seat to F, which as you can see here is a window bulkhead seat. This row supposedly had more legroom than the normal seats, which made me dread to see what the regular seats had in terms of legroom, since the space here is already pretty tight for a bulkhead. The in-flight entertainment came in the form of some paint on the wall, and there was a literature pocket whose size was generous enough to accommodate my various things. Like I said, the legroom wasn't great, but at the very least, it wasn't terrible. The tray table came out of the armrest, and of course there was a window. The overhead console held individual air nozzles, so all in all, it's about what you would expect for a seat that usually costs 140 euros one way. On this flight, I paid more like 300 euros since it was pretty last minute and I had a lot of luggage. For reference, at the time of booking, an economy seat on the Turkish flight would have cost 800. So they didn't turn off the cabin lights during takeoff, which for one was a little disconcerting in regards to their regard for safety, and for another it made for some really shitty takeoff footage, so forgive me as I skip ahead. With not much to see outside the plane and even less to do inside the plane, I turned to the important business of sleeping since it was gone 2am and I had a full day planned in Istanbul after my 6am arrival. 
See, it's not always glitz and glamour in life flat seats, sometimes it's a fully packed economy cabin with a seat that barely reclines, which is perfectly fine, you get what you pay for. Anyways, 30 minutes into the flight, a drink service was offered, and the crew also came around with my pre-selected meal, which in this case was a grilled meatball combo, although the meatballs were shaped more like patties than balls. I think it's a cultural thing. This was included in my business flex fare, and it was actually really good. Especially surprising is the fact that it was catered by Doe Co. Pegasus does have a buy on board menu, which changes seasonally, so do check your website for up-to-date selections. The prices are about average for the region, with my meal costing 11 euros by itself. Hi, future me here. So at this point, things started to get really interesting on this flight. Allow me to explain. So at this point in the flight after my meal, I wanted to get comfortable and get a little bit of sleep on this five hour flight. And just as I was getting comfortable, I noticed a peculiar smell and subsequently was horrified to find the source of it. And yes, this lady behind me decided to use my armrest as her footrest for her bare foot. Like, how the fuck do you even get into that position? So at this point, from where I was sitting, I tried to get the lady's attention, uh, but I could not for the life of me rouse her. She was fast asleep and snoring. So then I asked the cabin crew for help, and one of them did go up to her and try to wake her up. But when she couldn't wake her up, she just decided to leave the matter and went off on her business or whatever. Um, I was a little distraught with that. So a little bit later on, about 10 minutes later, I called the cabin crew again, and one of them again tried to wake her up. But when she couldn't, after like, not a very good effort of trying to do so, she went away again. And I felt like they were a little upset that I was bothering them. Perhaps you'll sympathize with me here when I say that at that point I was feeling tired, distraught, and frankly kind of disappointed with the way the crew were handling the situation. They kind of made me feel like I was the one bothering them and that it wasn't a big deal what was going on. And yeah, it's not an emergency or anything, but I feel like if someone's bare foot is on your armrest and you're scared of putting your arm down in case you touch their bare foot, that's a justified concern that should be addressed. About an hour later, she finally did remove her bare foot from my armrest, uh, but at that point I had no interest in using that armrest whatsoever, and the smell was still lingering. And for a little bit of context, it wasn't that much of a big deal. I've, like, I've seen worse on airplanes, and most of the time I don't really talk about it because it has to do with me filming with a gigantic camera, and that's not something you're gonna experience as a normal traveler, so it, it doesn't really matter, and it doesn't really bother me anyways. But in this instance, I feel like I should say something. While the passenger putting her foot on my armrest is definitely not the airline's fault, the way the flight attendants handled the situation did reflect upon the airline and their lack of concern with the situation highlights their attitude towards their passengers and I think that reflects on the airline as a whole. All right, so that's what happened. It's starting to rain and I'm losing this light, so let's go back to voiceover and end this video. So this was definitely one of the more adventurous flights I had this year and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. After that experience, I personally didn't get a very good impression from Pegasus. The crew gave off the vibe that they were tired and just wanted to go home, which is a sentiment I shared for the rest of the flight. After all, it was the dead of night on a red eye. Sleep deprivation was creeping on and I wasn't in a good mood. But looking back now, it was quite a funny situation I found myself in, and definitely one for the storybooks. I know it's not very scientific to base my conclusions off of one experience, but I think in the future I'll just stick with Turkish and only fly Pegasus if I have to, and only on a daytime flight. With all that said, if you've had better experiences with Pegasus, please do let me know down below and maybe I'll be convinced to give him another try. In the meantime, thanks for watching, wishing you and your loved ones good spirits and good health, and I'll see you next time.